classification of AUB. By now, we all should be experts about it. But what is exactly AUB? AUB is a heterogeneous group of conditions with diverse etiologies, which means that it's a whole basket of totally different things that you're talking about. And all of you are gynecologists, and I'm sure you know that it is almost the entire textbook of gynecology. And how can we even think about uh, treating the entire textbook of gynecology with a single modality of treatment? I think it depends on what is the actual underlying disease for AUB, where you need to talk about a treatment, the structural causes we've heard about enough, and when you make a structural diagnosis, you cannot cure it with medical management. If its structure is wrong, you have to correct the structure. So almost all of them go for some sort of a ma surgical management. So can there be one single appropriate management approach for a heterogeneous group of disorders? Structural problems need structural remedies. And the other the causes, the most of them are functional causes, where there is one function or another is in a disorder. So you really cannot have the same treatment for all of them either, whatever your medical management is. So you end up saying that specific treatment for specific causes, other than one sub-segment of AUB, which is AUBO, which is ovarian dysfunction, can happen in young women or perimenopausal women, can happen in obesity or extreme weight loss. If there is no common treatment. Treatment should not be initiated until etiology of AUB is evaluated. Not a very difficult task. It's something that you do every day in your clinics. It's a good history, a good examination, and a bedside ultrasound, which even the little towns in, in all of India have today can give you at least a signal of what the cause is. And the empirical treatment without evaluation may miss a structural correctable lesion, or worse, it may mask the symptoms of a neoplastic disease. So there's only one subclass that can be treated medically right away, and that is AUBO. And the differentiation has to be made prior to the treatment. And the differentiation also has to be made from AUB to heavy menstrual bleeding, or HMB. HMB is a regular ovulatory cyclical bleeding, heavy bleeding, and AUBO is irregular, non-ovulatory, non-cyclic bleeding, and that is the only subsegment that can be even treated medically. But when it comes to that, the underlying pathophysiology has to be thought about, and a logical approach has to be there. And when the endometrium proliferates beyond the ability of endogenous estrogen to maintain the integrity, it breaks down and bleeds. So in that situation, you need more estrogens to make it more stable. And the endometrium also can get converted into secretory endometrium, and then the bleeding is more predictable. And if it's not progesterone, it's not there. The shedding becomes irregular and prolonged, in which case you need progesterones to control this bleeding. So there is definite subsects of AUBO, which you cannot treat by anything other than hormonal treatment. And this subsegment, where the underlying problem is hormones, will have to be treated by hormones. And it is an ovulatory dysfunction and an underlying hormonal imbalance. When you have a hormonal imbalance, it needs to be treated by hormones to be effective. And this situation where there's clearly a hormonal imbalance cannot be treated adequately by non-hormonal medications. And the first line of options then in this situation is hormonal therapy. And you all know that the woman who has irregular cycles has been already bleeding for 25 days, walks into your office, and by giving her whatever coagulation agents or whatever the other kind of treatments that you heard about aren't going to work. And unless you supplement either the estrogen or progesterone, whichever is needed for the underlying pathology, you're not going to be able to control it. So it could be ENP combinations. It could be oral progestin therapy. Or it can be LNG IUD. These are just things which are easily available to us. And a short-term treatment with this immediately has a response, decreases or stops bleeding. Long-term decreases long-term endometrial changes and is helpful. And combination ENP, it can be monophasic pills are much more useful. It's such as practical tips, which pill do you choose? It has to be a monophasic pill and more frequently given in the first day or two until the bleeding comes down, then can be phased down to every 12 hours and then one pill a day once you accomplish. And one cycle, if you correct it, then you can look at the underlying causes for anovulation and correct them as well. ENP can be given in a different way rather than the regular or oral contraceptive pills. The FDA recommends two other combinations, but these combinations are not available to us in India. 
This is a combination of estradiol valerate and Dynagest at a much lesser dosage than what you have in the majority of oral contraceptives, usually used for perimenopausal women for hormonal support. And there is another combination of ethinyl estradiol, which is far, far lower than the usual oral contraceptives with norethindrone acetate. It can be given cyclically, it can be given extended, it can be given continuously as well, whichever you choose to, depending on the situation. High-dose oral progesterones do work, and with norethindrone, it's five milligrams and one to two, three tablets a day. MPA is where you end up giving a far higher dosage, and, but then norethindrone is much more potent and has a lot less side effects than MPA, so longer duration of therapies per cycle is more effective than seven to 10 days. A lot of us are used to giving it shorter for each cycle and the control that you obtain with a shortage, shorter usage of progesterone is not adequate. So it's been shown in good studies now if you have to use it effectively, you have to use it for a 20 day cycle rather than a seven day cycle. LNG of course releases a smaller amount every day and it can be a long term management for an acute bleed, it doesn't work that well. Adolescents, there is another problem that endometrium is, has not been prepared very well with estrogen. So in this particular situation, you definitely need to use them. I, estrogens and very severe cases, the young girls that come in with a hemoglobin of three grams and four grams, which often happens, it intervenes use of conjugated estrogens followed by progesterone at a later time. And maintenance management in these younger women now has also been suggested to be micronized oral progestin 200 milligrams every night for the first 12 days of each calendar month. In younger girls, it's much more easy to give them a prescription like that. So it's choosing the right hormone therapy is very important. Oral contraceptives are generally cho chosen in younger patients where there's no contraindication to estrogen therapy and there's no gross obesity. Oral progesterone therapy in perimenopausal women who might have metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, high BMI or relative contraindications of other things for estrogens do much better on progesterone alone. And because this is the age group where you come across a lot of the AUBO, I think oral progesterones are a predominant way of treating them. Non-contraceptive ENP, which is available to you. LNG IUD for a long-term usage, but not for tre treating the acute hemorrhage. And in adolescents, you may need to use estrogen herma. And the HMB management is where you have published literature on comparative efficacies. And you can see from those numbers, even when there is no hormonal imbalance, hormone therapy is di distinctly better. So it goes without saying that in published literature, when you use hormones, you control the AUB far better at a far earlier period of time. The non-hormonal therapies have already been talked about extensively, mm -hmm. but you have to use a much, much larger yeah. dose of tranexamic acid. And that also is contraindicated, can become contraindicated in a woman with a metabolic syndrome in the perimenopausal age group, where you do not want to promote coagulation unnecessarily. NSAIDs, you know what the side effects of NSAIDs used for a longer period are. So if it's an acute a AUBO, whether it's an adolescent where it's severe or whether it's a perimenopausal woman who's been bleeding for a longer period of time, hormones do work earlier, hormones do work better. The trick is to choose the right hormone at the right dose and keep it for the right amount of time. Thank you. In patients which are not medically managed, only hysterectomy is the answer, and I'm speaking for the motion, no other surgical uh, uh, procedure would do. In the next five minutes, I'll take you over for the motion with all evidence in place. Non-medical interventions, there's a long list, and I am not going into uh, details, microwave, balloon, free fluid, photodynamic, uh, you, a long, long list. And the last is hysterectomy. Now, when we take our decisions, all our decisions for modality of treatment are based on histopathological report of DNC. Is it hormonal, hyperplasia, carcinoma? And it's seen that 4.4% cases of AUB may have an endometrial cancer. Peri and postmenopausal, the incidence increases to 10%. How accurate is your endometrial sampling? 
In this paper in 2015, it was seen that 46% cases of simple hyperplasia were missed on curatage. 50% cases diagnosed as simple hyperplasia on curatage were normal, with a sensitivity and specificity of only 53% and 38%. For endometrial cancer patients, it was seen that there was a false negative rate of 7.6% and 37% of the patients were undergraded tumors. The reason that uh, study showed that only 60% of the patients had half the uterine cavity curated and 16% a quarter. That means we are actually not curating the whole cavity and sampling the whole cavity. So should we risk missing an endometrial carcinoma by doing a conservative surgery? No, especially in case patients have completed their family and do not need the uterus. For us, patient safety is first. Next comes patient satisfaction. Now, what is our ultimate goal in treating AUB patients? It is to reduce the menstrual flow in order to improve the quality of life. And total hysterectomy is superior in attaining amenorrhea. The SOGC guidelines in 2013 have stated 90% satisfaction for conservative surgery. But although satisfaction with ablation is high, there was slightly greater patient satisfaction at one year with when the uterus was removed. So after one year, maybe the ablation techniques are not as good as the hysterectomy in results. If family is not completed and she has pathologies like fibroids and polyps, yes, myomectomy or polypectomy is justified. What about reoperation rates? St studies have found that an endo uh, when you ablate the endometrium, the patients, there's an increase steadily over time of up to 30% of reoccurrence over four years. This is the SOGC guideline 2013. And why is that so? Because there may be coincidental pathology which may have remained undiagnosed, especially adenomyosis, 40% of the cases, and it is seen that in these cases, conservative therapy will not work. Secondly, there may be patchy ablation. Patchy ablation with balloon therapy is known as it does not reach the cornua, and equipment failure may be more common with blind techniques where the temperature really may not reach the levels required to ablate. Experience of the surgeon, it was seen that the hysterectomy rate after endometrial, uh, after the conservative techniques have been reported at 12.6 for a consultant surgeon and 38% for a trainee. India has a huge rural sector. India has many towns which are lesser equipped where they have experienced surgeons for hysterectomy but maybe not for endoscopic surgery. Let's say, okay, now let's go on to the next part that our surgery was successful and she became amenorrheic. What does logic say? We have induced amenorrhea. What do we need this amenorrheic uterus for? The primary function of the uterus is pregnancy. Why keep it there and risk a chance of endometrial carcinoma, carcinoma cervix, or at a later date, a prolapse uterus for which you'll end up doing a hysterectomy? Surgeons always remove the appendix on opening the abdomen. Then why are we so obsessed with preserving the uterus? Fertility status post endometrial ablation. It has been reported that there have been pregnancies with uh, major complication rates such as placenta accreta, perinatal mo mortality is higher. And we saddle this patient when she did not even want a pregnancy with a complicated pregnancy. And for premenopausal women undergoing ablation, we have to counsel them for effective contraception. Con contraception. Are these treatments free of complications? No, there may be life-threatening problems with this, and uh, we need to actually see wh wh whether we want the patient to undergo these problems. Total laparoscopic hysterectomy has a shorter stay. Non-descent vaginal is a very good option. Patients are mobile. There are other issues like equipment cost, lack of availability, trained manpower, and when you look at the cost-benefit analysis, it is seen that because of repeated visits after conservative surgery, virtually after four years, the cost is actually equal. So we need to evaluate the cost not only in terms of finances, but in terms of time and stress which the patient undergoes. To conclude, these interventions only add cost while delaying, not preventing the ultimate performance of hysterectomy. And as human beings, we look for permanent solutions of our problem. Hysterectomy, hysterectomy is the only permanent solution. At the same time, these methods add a risk of missing a carcinoma or development of a carcinoma at a later date. 
and whenever we take our decisions, we must always remember the oath we took, do no harm, patient safety is first. It is better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. The question in the last five minutes has been pretty much settled for hysterectomy. However, for good ideas and true innovation, you need human interaction, conflict, argument and debate. It's an abnormal uterine bleeding. It can occur in adolescent phase, in reproductive age group, and perimenopausal age group. And due to advancement in the pharmaceutical modalities and imaging technologies, hysterectomy sounds obsolete for AUB except for advanced malignancies. N number of effective conservative treatments are available today. For adolescent, you treat the cause, you give them bleeding factor, uh, factors which are absent. So no hysterectomy for adolescent. Again, reproductive age group. She desires a child bloody. You want to remove her uterus? No way. She's got PCO treated. If she doesn't want a child, hormonal treatment, Mrudubhashini is very nicely told. Obese patient, come on, give a weight reduction and lifestyle change. Polyp submucous fibrous, hysteroscopic removal. Why hysterectomy? No hysterectomy. Perimenopause. Maybe because of hormonal imbalance and ovulation hypothyroidism, you can treat it very well. Uterine factors, I'll just come across. Even in CA endometrium nowadays, I'm an ART specialist. So I have to give a baby to them also. So I'll cure it medically, surgically, and then give her a baby. Why remove uterus? No removal. Now, there are various men, uh, uh, modalities available to us. Pap smear, 68% sensitivity, 79% specificity. We got liquid by cytology. We got colposcopy, which tells 97% perfectly. Office endometrial biopsy is there. Office hysteroscopy with biopsy. MRI is there. And my Narendra Malhotra, excellent in 3D, 4D. And you can diagnose when there is no malignancy. Why hysterectomy? Let us see adenomyosis. Now, this is the commonest cause in AUB and dysmenorrhea. Now, we've got excellent GNRH analogs, which causes significant reduction in size of adenomyoma, myoma up to 65%. There's also blood loss is less and relief of dysmenorrhea. So, in adenomyosis, if it is very big, come on, you add even Mirena to that. Mirena is also, along with GNRH analog, you use GNRH analog, reduce the size, put in a Mirena, excellent double treatment, and definitely evaluated by menstrual calendar, the bleeding is less, and dysmenorrhea is also reduced as per VS scores. Take it from fibroids. No more an indication for hysterectomy. You can do very nice sub, uh, submucous myomas. You can do hysteroscopic resection. It is shown that 66% of the cases, complete removal is possible, whatever big size is there. 91% improvement in menstrual symptoms and 81% patient satisfaction. No long stay, no scar, no posture. Why remove the uterus? Intermural fibroids. We have excellent surgeons doing laparoscopic removal of all the myomas and along with that, the bleeding also reduces. If that is not possible, patient is not physically fit, then you have excellent treatment like uterine artery embolization. It is shown 96% improvement in menorrhagia, 89% improvement in dysmenorrhea, and 100% secondary success rate after second sitting. It is safe, highly effective compared to hysterectomy. Why hysterectomy? No hysterectomy. Now we have got excellent treatment which is OPD based, office procedure, no hospital stage. It is MRI guided focus ultrasound treatment. Now this is a treatment in which MRI for the target definition, we treat planning and selective ablation of that fibroids without touching the surrounding tissue. So it is real time monitoring is also possible. So in such cases also, in fibroids also, you can give excellent treatment with MRI-focused ultrasound uh, ablation. And Mirena is there. I'm very fond of, I'm very fond. On the contrary, RCOG guidelines say in abroad, when you have menorrhagia cases, unless you use uh, hormonal treatment, Mirena, even they do not get their insurance, you know. Insurance coverage is not possible. So you have to try and save the uterus. Mirena reduces bleeding, it reduces the leomyma size, volume, 
is it is useful in multiple myomas also and there is a gnrh analog which also causes reduction in size it improves in anemia we have got antagonists we are art specialists we have to give babies even at the post menopausal age so why remove uterus last important is dub they have beautifully talked about pranexamic acid serms dinogest and lns ius we got excellent i am i am a protagonist of rollerball and this uh, um, endometrial ablations and you can see the procedure causes only 2 minutes to 10 minutes and you can see amenorrhea 40% to 70% and patient satisfaction every more than 90% patient satisfaction so definitely we have got very beautiful endometrial ablations post menopausal also hrt to be adjusted hysteroscopy if shows no cancer no need of hysterectomy and what about complications she is talking no complications are every every hysterectomy has got complications you it may be anesthesia i remember a very beautiful very nice lady walked in for a laparoscopic hysterectomy anesthesia se kabhi bahar hi nahi aayi and for 2 years bahar nahi aayi fir kahan pahunchi malum nahi so there are so many complications hemorrhage uterine injuries bowel injuries bladder injuries my god secondary hemorrhage and death friends i don't want to kill my patients i am going to save all the uterine and thank you very much save the uterus like save the girl child